Welcome to Astrid Investigates, created by Flying Bridge Theatre's new online repertory company. The scripts have been written by our two artistic directors, Tim Baker and Daniel Swellian Williams, inspired by the short stories of Alan Roderick. This series of audio dramas is part of our response to the coronavirus lockdown of 2020. Without stages on which to play, we've tried to emulate as far as possible the immediacy and intimacy of live theatre. Therefore, each episode is recorded as a single take by actors, technicians and a director working remotely from home studios linked and mixed live across the internet. What you hear has not been edited, it's how it was performed. Music and direction by Tim Baker, technical support by Matthew Williams, marketing and distribution by Jamie Reese. Astrid Price, private investigator, is played by Manon Eames and all other characters are played by Daniel Llewellyn Williams. This project has been made possible by the Arts Council of Wales, the National Lottery and the Welsh Government. We hope you enjoy. Diolch. Once upon a midnight dreary, as I wandered weak and weary, across the moss-soaked gravestones time left broken on the floor. Though the fog smelled of an onion, I sat to ease my aching bunion, my sense abandoned for that lost companion, cried I the name of my Lenore. Lenore! Lenore! Only this, and nothing more. In grief I nodded, nearly napping. Suddenly there came a tapping, at her tombstone gently rapping. Was this the ghost of my Lenore? So scared was I, I started crapping. Yes, that rapper stopped me napping. As the rap became a flapping of a bird, I cried, No more! Set me free, O ghastly raven! From my grief I do implore! Quoth the raven, Nevermore. I banged my head. Ow! Pitch black. I tried to lift my leg. Bang. My knee. Thud. Oh, I'm in some sort of a tunnel. My face pressed against velvet. My arms pinned by my sides. I'm in a box. A long, body-shaped coffin. I'm in a coffin. I, I've been buried alive. I've been buried alive. Help me. Help me. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Ah! Hey, Astrid, Astrid, you okay? It's me, Stakis. Oh, oh, Stakis. Oh, bloody hell. What are you doing? Oh, i sorry to wake you. I thought you might want some chips and fish before I turn off the fryers downstairs and close the shop. You, you, Stakis... I thought I was going to die. Hey, was this you reading scary stories? Yeah, Starkis, before bed, maybe not a good idea. I didn't know you was asleep. i sorry. You keep shouting something. I hear it in the shop. Lenore, Lenore, Lenore. That's right, Lenore. You trying to remind me, innit? I know forget the fabric softener again. Don't you worry. No, no, not that, Lenore. It's a woman, Stakis, from this gothic poem about grief. A man loses his love, Lenore, and then he loses his mind with the grief. You know, Alan Edgar Pocock. Alan Edgar Pocock Waka? He was a horror writer. Oh, never mind, Stakis. Well, what's that you were wearing? Oh, I'm so sorry. I only am trying on my costume for the Halloween dance on Saturday night. I am mummy from Egypt. Ooh. Oh, yeah, of course. Halloween. You look spooky. Well, I'm glad you're seeming better. You've been very sick, you know, screaming all the night and sleeping all the day for a week. Your mother and me been very worried about you. Thank you, Starkis. I don't really know why, but I'd appreciate you not telling Mam about this little episode, because, like you say, she does worry. Yes, 
I know. You you wanna talk about it? No, thank you, Sakis. Okay, but you know, this is no good. It's no good for your business. You stop working and you lie in bed all day. I mean, how are you gonna stay on top as Wales' best private detective? Look, my dreams don't lie. Something's coming. Someone, racked with grief, is crying for help. They need me to save them. That phone is going to ring soon. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, please. I understand you've been sick with melon and cauliflower, innit? Melancholy, Stachis. Or depression, as we call it nowadays. OK, OK. But I tell you straight and not go round the corner. The person crying for help is you. Oh, stop it, Stachis. You want I tell your mother? Oh, you were like an old washer person, you are. Anyway, changing the subject. The Halloween dance. Oh, yes. The Monster's Ball. I gonna dance with your mother, innit? Exciting. I practice my mashed potato all day. You you wanna show you? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Postman. <laughs> hey! You like my moves, Astrid? Yeah, you lovely stock. It's beautiful footwork. You know... I don't want to embarrass your mother. How are you going to embarrass a Stachis? Well, by being, you know, Stachis, innit? Oh, what are you on about? My mama does, you. Cooey! Are you loves? Blooming heck, Mrs. P, you scared me, innit? Ooh, you scared me just like that. Now then, now then, Mr Theodorakis, I'll be driving a stick through your heart at the dance, you naughty boy. Mrs P, the onion ring to my deep-fried Mars bar. Come here and give Stuckies a kiss. Oh, go on then. Just this once. Mwah. Oh, right on the kisser. And take this. Oh, Stuckies, you make me feel like a, a natural woman. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, Mrs. P, you make my bandages rise up, innit? They've fallen off. Well, we can't do it with your bandages on, can we? <laughs> you better stop it. No, you stop it. No, you first. No, you. You. Uh, 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 um. Oh, uh, sorry, Astrid. Yeah, sorry, Cariad. We forgot you was there. Me and Stachis does get carried away sometimes. Yeah, well, perhaps you two should maybe get a room. Why would we do that? we got a perfectly good one here, what I shares with you. Oh, OK, never mind. Let's start again. Hiya, ma'am, what have you been doing today? Mm, nothing much. Just went into town, Cariad, cashed in my gyro at the post office. How are you feeling? You've been in bed all day. Is she still suffering from that melanin cauliflower? Oh, I'm going to murder that greengrocer, I am. Listen, ma'am, Starkus have been cheering me up, showing off his Halloween costume. Oh, yes, there we are. Let's look at you, Starkus. Oh, there's lovely. So what are you? A waste paper basket, is it? No, I... No, let me guess. You're a homeless person. No, I... I got it. Chip paper man. No, I am mummy. From Egypt. Ooh. Oh, dear. Never mind. Well, we still got a couple of days left to work on it, haven't we? Look, ma'am, Sarkis, I gotta go. Get out the flat. Go for a walk. All right, love. Yeah, let me get you up out of bed. Oh, oh. look at this now. All these black feathers. What? Oh, my God. That's... They are raven feathers. I told you, no animals in this flat. It isn't a menage a trois, you know. Do you mean a menagerie, ma'am? Oh, no, I prefer butter, I does. No, ma'am, menagerie. Don't be so vulgar, you. I won't have toilet mouth in my house. No tropical birds, neither. No, I had a dream about a raven I did. And it's not a tropical bird, ma'am. It's a big black omen of grief. Someone's in pain and needs my help. My psychic powers must be getting stronger. Anyway, it's my flat, ma'am, and I'll do what I want. Well, my bed's it anyway. Oh, don't be like that. I didn't mean to upset you. Forget it. I'm off, ma'am. Creak. Slam. Walking down the street, my Mac pulled up to my ears. 
The rain thuds and runs in tubes off the nose of my fedora. It's pissing it down. I lose count of the number of cats and dogs. By the time I get to the end of the street, we're talking entire catteries and kennels. I think perhaps it's time for me to start building a Noah's Ark of my own, not least for somewhere to put all these bloody animals. I walk for hours in the dark and rain, and eventually, at near midnight, I'm standing on the town bridge over the river Oisk. The high tide amplifies the chorus of a billion heavy droplets as they tear into the water's surface. I stop and feel the October chill chasing away any goodwill of the retreating summer, and my soul sinks another inch. What am I doing with my life? I've achieved a bit, I suppose, in the past, won the Rugby World Cup for Wales, plus a few other sporting achievements, but I've always felt there was more I could do. The clock tower bell rings out for midnight. Bong. Oh, why did I become a detective? Bong. I used to think I could take the pressure, but now I'm full of self-doubt. Bong. What's wrong with me? Bong. Maybe all those cases have finally taken their toll. Bong. Oh, I don't know. Bong. Why hasn't my phone rung? Bong. I've lost all my powers. Bong. Bong. I have nothing left to offer. Bong. 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 The rain stops. I look down at the surface of the river and imagine the coldness consuming me, the water freeing me from my misery. Before I know it, I begin to tip forward. Don't do it! Ah! Who are you? You don't want to do that, believe me. You've got loads of life to live. You're going to go on and do great things, Astrid Price. Believe me, there'll be brighter days. The sun will shine again. I've never met this woman before, but there's something very comforting about her. Her outfit is old-fashioned, really old-fashioned, which belies the 30-something face underneath her vintage hat. She smiles me a warm smile, and there's a sadness in her kind eyes, and... She knows my name. I'm sorry, miss. I don't know what you were talking about. I was just standing with my thoughts. Of course. Forgive me. You are Mrs Price, the rugby player? My name is Fran Campbell. Call me Fran. Hello, Fran. Actually, I'm Ms Price, the ex-rugby player. And call me Astrid. I do apologise. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance, Astrid. Can I assist you? No, thank you. Now, if you'll just excuse me, I need a late night bar to get drunk in. Well, uh, Astrid, I I was actually after speaking to you. I wonder if you might be able to help me. It's not your usual assignment, I'm sure. I think to myself it's not my usual business I was either. But something tells me she could be my person in need. Five minutes later, we're in my office. I'm sat at my desk, Fran Campbell standing opposite me. I give her the sort of smile that says, You are safe here in these two rooms above the Lion Cod chip shop, but feel free to pour out all the troubles you like. I'm here to listen, I'm here to help. It's a lot to convey in a smile, I know, but I was confident she got the message. What can I do for you, Fran? Well, Astrid, it's a long story. May I sit down? Yes, of course. Yeah. Creak. Ah, thank you. So, tell me, what's on you a plate, Fran? I'm not sure whether you'd be interested in a story like this. I feel foolish now. Oh, please don't. Try me. It won't hurt to talk. All right. My son, Darren, well, he died six months ago. He was five years old. That's a big opening line, and I'm instantly there with her. As you'd expect, I'm I'm still in shock. I'll always be in shock, I think. Excuse me. Fran pauses, and in that moment I see a woman coping with grief in the most remarkable way. Her stillness is impeccable, and she oozes dignity in the face of the unimaginable. Eventually, she goes on. Darren is buried in Pantglass Cemetery. 
I visit his grave as often as I can. Darren was my only child. I, I can't let him go. He seems to be only in the next room, to be honest. It's the most peculiar thing, the death of a child. I, I feel like... I don't know... I don't know what to feel. Is there a Mr Campbell? There was never a Mr Campbell, Astrid. I see. Go on. Well, my parents were killed in the Blitz, so I knows a lot about grief. But this is so much different. Her statement makes me short-circuit slightly. The Blitz? What's she talking about? That was 80 years ago. Perhaps she's confused, poor Dot. I can't stop thinking about how lonely Darren must be, wherever he is now. I was his only playmate. I always go to his grave and... One day, I decided to whittle him a toy, which I left for him. Then I made another, and another... A new toy for each visit. Windmills, cars, little soldiers, birds, anything and everything, really. I hope you don't think this is silly. We do what we need to do, Fran. I know they're just toys, but... I made dozens and dozens and dozens over the months and... Well, they make me feel connected to Darren. It's helped me. I'd, I'd sit on his grave for hours, just playing, like we did when he was with me. I even began to smile again, Astrid. Oh, dear. I pass her a tissue to wipe away what I hope are healing tears, but I suspect Fran is a long way from healing. My sympathy for her is almost overwhelming. I want to take her to my bosom and cut her so hard she becomes a part of me. Something awful is happening now. Miss Price, I, I, I mean Astrid, sorry. Oh, it's, it's breaking my heart. I, I can't, I, I don't know how, I, I, I don't think I want to carry on. What's happened, Fran? What's happening? Please, let me help you. Well, it started a, a couple of weeks ago. I got to the grave in the morning with a new toy, but it seemed like some of the toys were missing. And then the next day, more were gone, definitely. A, a bird, yeah, a small soldier there. I didn't want to think that he was being stolen because that was just too horrible to contemplate. I mean, how could somebody be so mean and cruel? Before I knew it, there... They were all being taken, they were. As fast as I could whittle them. It's destroying me. That's shocking. I don't know what to say. It's horrible. <laughs> Do you think I should have gone to the police? The Headley? No. Since we became the Independent Republic of Cymru, they're too busy giving out speeding tickets. Oh, it's awful. I agree. It's such a vicious campaign against our drivers. What? Oh. Oh, you didn't mean that, did you? No, I didn't. May I continue? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Fran. You were saying... Well, <clears throat> it's breaking my heart. They're desecrating Darren's memory. I want to find out who's doing this to my little boy's grave and why. I need to know so I can be at peace and finally rest. You are my last hope. Say you'll help me, please. I pause for a second to think... I consider my recent malaise. Perhaps I need to nourish my soul a little. Oh, for goodness sake, Astrid, stop thinking about yourself. Do this for Fran. Besides, a paycheck wouldn't go amiss. Oh, and another very important thing. I have no money, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm sorry if I've wasted you a time. Fran stands to leave. The 5% of my Scottish DNA tells me, no money, let the woman go. But then I stop myself. I remember my moments of despair earlier. Wait, Fran, I will help you and I waive my fee. You will? Oh, how marvellous. I'm going to go to the cemetery and catch whoever it is in the act. How often is this happening? Every night. Well, it must be at night because uh, I usually stay at his graveside throughout the daytime, see? Thank you, Fran. I'll go there now. 
But first, tell me a little bit more about Darren. I'd love to hear about him. Fran speaks gorgeously about her love for a little boy, and I just sit and listen. Half an hour later, it's the dead of night. I pull up to the gates of Punk Glass Cemetery, tears still streaming down my face. Punk Glass Cemetery is full of Victorian monuments. It's a gothic orgy of splendour, once glorious but now dripping with moss, and each statue, headstone and sarcophagus leans at a weary angular decay. Since the breakup of the UK, following the Great Pandemic and the subsequent Celtic Spring, the main theme in our new cemeteries is our new religion, rugby. Busts of the great Gatlin Warren and rugby ball-shaped monuments everywhere. However, I thank the great referee that this cemetery exists untouched. If we forget our past, how can we decide our future? I park outside the great wrought iron gates in my yellow gilbin, the finest two-seater hill racer ever to come out of South Wales. I switch on Giri, my Gilburn intelligence robotic investigator, the sharpest tool in my detective's toolbox. Boop. Hello, Astrid. How are you? Fine, thank you, Giri. How may I help you today? I need a grave location, Panclass Cemetery. Tell me the whereabouts of the final resting place of a Darren Campbell. Right you are. Text message to Brian. What would you like it to say? Sweet scrum half. No, Giri, I don't want to send a text message to Brian. I never want to send a text message to Brian. I don't even know a Brian to whom I would ever want to send a fucking text. Do you understand? Just do your bloody job, you twat. Well, that's not very pleasant. Look, I'm just not in the mood. Just shut up and tell me where Darren Campbell is buried. Which would you prefer? Shut up or tell you where Darren Campbell is buried? I can't do both. Oh, Giddy, listen. A mother is utterly devastated and I have to help her, so please stop wasting my time. As you wish. Beep. Located at plot 753B on the Upper Anglican Bank lies the grave of Darren Campbell, born 6th of December. Oh, that is most peculiar. Thank you, Giddy. I'll be back later. You say you've met his mother, Astrid? I haven't got time for this, Giddy. Are you sure about that? Goodbye, Giddy. Uh, wait, Astrid! Click! Creak! Slam! I don't have a moment to lose. The thief could be nearby. I vault over a low part of the wall and suddenly I'm in the middle of a gothic novel. The mist hangs heavy in the wet grey night and full moon shafts carve finger-like through it. They strike still silver, dappling the October yew trees that crisscross their way towards Darren's grave. Towards him I tread, crunchingly, foot after foot, across browning pine seed and thistledown. Each step raises the rising damp further through my shoe leather where it holds my toes in its clinging, moist grip. The fox-crying darkness pulls my heart to the edge of my chest and my ears narrow, waiting for those sharp spaces in that deathly still. A chill drips up my back from my pelvis to my skull. At last, I find the grave of Darren Campbell, a standing headstone partially obscured by grass. A raven watches in a tree above the tomb, I take out the wooden toy that Fran has given me as bait and place it on the gravestone. I wait for hours on end for the thief to show their face. Suddenly, my mobile phone rings. Hello? Jenny, is that you? Astrid, how the devil are you? Peter Jennings is something of a constant in my life these last few years. Former diplomat turned head of M.I. Hwyr, he has helped me with many of my cases, not least because he has an industrial-grade crush on me. I have to say the feeling is mutual, but I try not to tell him that. Peter, I'm fine, thank you. On a stakeout in a cemetery at the moment. Oh, I see. Some ghostly goings-on, I presume. It's more than likely just some teenage pranks, but it's really affecting a poor, bereaved mother. Ah, right you are. Sounds like a passion project. If you like, Jenny. I just need to do something good. Something to help a suffering person. Why are you calling, Jenny? It's two in the morning. Yes, I do apologise. I called your flat and spoke to your mother earlier. Colourful lady. Delightful. She told me you were spending the night in a cemetery. We both pondered over the wisdom, considering your recent slump. She's worried about you, Astrid. I'm worried about you. Oh, for Gatlin's sake. No need for blasphemy. Well, I wish my man wouldn't talk about me behind my back, to be honest. Especially to a stranger. Stranger? Oh, dear. 
I've upset you. I, I had hoped to surprise you with an invitation to the Monsters' Ball on Saturday night. I thought you could do with the lift, my dear. Well, if you speak to my mother again, you can tell her to lift this. Beep! I hung up and vow to keep Peter at arm's length and on a professional level from now on. I sit with a hip flask and wait. Before long, I decide that if I'm going to stay any longer, I need to do some Dai Chi, the ancient Welsh martial art that I've been devoted to ever since giving up professional rugby. It's kept me fit in both mind and body. I was pleased to feel the burn as I lower myself after a brief warm-up into the most advanced of the Dai Chi poses, the leaking leak, and then I hear it. Somewhere in the distance, a faint tap, tap, tapping. In the half-light, I duck down into my hiding place. I can't see anything, but the tapping continues to get louder. I peer towards the grave and see the toy sat there, alone, on top of the headstone. The tap continues to grow and a great unease descends upon me. Am I dealing with the supernatural? This is remarkably like my dream. I venture out slowly towards the grave. I break cover, stepping into the moonlight, all the while, tap, 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 nobody around. What the hell is making this noise? Is it coming from his grave? I edge closer, and then, once I'm stood square in front of it, I realise something that terrifies me. The taps are coming from beneath my feet, inside his actual grave. My heart races and I suddenly feel faint. This can't be real. I turn to run, but as I do, I hear the distinct beat of bird wings behind me. I turn back. The raven is right before me, perched on Darren's monument like a gothic bust. It looks at me with dead eyes. I wait, half expecting it to say the word, never more, but nothing. Then it points its beak down to the gravestone. Is it pointing downwards at something? I reach forward with a shaky hand and pull aside the long grass. The headstone reads... Here lies Darren Campbell, died age five of polio, 1948. What? I don't understand. 1948? I rub at the weathered letters. Surely this can't be right. There are more words. The grave has another occupant. Joined soon after by his mother... Francis Campbell died 1950. What? In my head, an orchestra strikes a bass to Carter and Fugue. Was I not speaking to Frank Campbell just a few hours ago? Suddenly, the raven picks up the wooden figure and flies away. I follow, stumbling over gravestones until I reach the edge of a wood. The raven calls me from inside and I shudder. What am I going to find? I push aside the bare twigs and peer within. As my eyes adjust, at first I see a small clearing cloistered by rocks and tree stumps, carpeted with leaves. Then, slowly, objects strewn all over the floor come into focus. They look like dozens and dozens of small wooden toys, all arranged in complex scenarios. A street scene, a farmyard, dinosaurs and windmills, toy soldiers in mid-battle. Then, as my eyes complete the picture... My knees buckle and my heart nearly stops. I see the silhouette of a little boy sat among the toys, playing. Are my eyes deceiving me? I move to get a better view, but as I do, snap! I step on a twig. The boy turns towards me and my blood goes cold. I do really love these toys. Please say thank you to Mummy. The raven squawks. I jump in shock. Ah! Oh! And then when I look back, no child, no toys, nothing. Just dark amber and crimson leaves feathering this peaceful little enclosure. I ask myself what it is I've just witnessed, but I have no answers. And so, ma'am, Stachis, that's what happened to me last night. Now you know everything I know about Fran and Darren Campbell, ma'am. Oh, my blindside flanker. Am I going mad, ma'am? Could Fran have been a ghost? Astrid, you are not going mad. You are clairvoyage, you are. But she died in 1950. Astrid, my darling, 
I've been listening to all you've said and i got to tell you something. Sit yourself down now, love. Well, why? Astrid. Fran Campbell was my mam's sister. She killed herself. Jumped off Castnewith Bridge before I was born. 1950. It's one of our family stories. She jumped at midnight on the 29th of October. Holy five metre scrum, ma'am. And last night was the 29th of October. Yeah. The, the story goes she was she was terrible destroyed, she was, after she lost her son, Darren. Oh, ma'am, I met her on the bridge where she killed herself. She said she needed to know who was stealing the toys so she could rest, so she could have peace. That'll be why she killed herself. Because she never found out who it was. But you know who did it now. The raven. You tell Fran that. Oh, what am I going to do, Starkis? Get an Ouija board and tell my great dead auntie that her son's grave was vandalised by a crazed Covid? Yes, the raven. He carries the love tokens from this world to the next, to Darren. The forest you saw, Astrid, it was the afterlife. Bloody hell, Sarkis. How do you know that? Hey, it's Greek, isn't it? The raven is the messenger of the gods, so nobody stole the toys after all. But that doesn't explain why Fran came to Astrid last night on a bridge. Was it just sudden rippity? Oh, ma'am, I think I know what happened. What? What happened? Oh, I'm really sorry, ma'am, but I can't tell you. All right, my girl. I trust you. Thank you, ma'am. I think I know what to do. I'm going to go. Where? To the bridge. Why? To save Fran, ma'am. Click. Creak. But carry out, she's dead. Slam. I rush to the bridge. Bong. As I get there, the clock starts to chime. Midnight. Bong. It's pouring down again. Bong. But this time I hadn't stopped for my hat and coat. Bong. I get to the middle of the bridge. Bong. To the spot where I'd met Fran. Bong. Last night, at midnight. Bong. The spot where she jumped. Bong. All those years earlier. Bong. I want to tell her the truth. Bong. I want to save her. Bong. It's midnight. Bong. I look up and down the bridge. Nothing. Just a torrential downpour. I wait. I stare at the river and think about what poor Fran felt as the water consumed her. I scream at the river. Thank you, Fran. Thank you for saving me. I wait. Nothing. Just more rain. Can she hear me? I don't know. Fran, I saw him. Darren has the toys. He's happy. He says thank you. I pull away from the side of the bridge and weep. The rain stops. The greyness parts and for a moment I bathe in a narrow corridor of shimmering October moonlight. But I'm not cold. I feel warm, as if held in a loving embrace. I feel love. Tomorrow is a day to begin again. I meander home to a warm bed and spend the rest of the night with my thoughts. Next morning, Mam wakes me. I've slept in. I am Astrid. Wake up, sleepyhead. Feeling any better? You think you might be up for coming to the Halloween dance tonight? Oh, ma'am. At the bridge last night, I felt like, I don't know, like she was actually there? Like who was actually there, sweetheart? Auntie Fran. You a great Auntie Fran? What are you on about? Don't be daft, ma'am. Oh, no. It was family story. Great Auntie Fran who killed herself in 1950. 1950? Your great Auntie Fran died in 1977. Mum, what are you talking about last night? The raven and... Oh, Astrid, you're being delirious again, aren't you? She's there, on that photo on a wall. You've been looking at it all your life. What photo? God, I, I, I never seen this before. Oh, darling, you are struggling, aren't you? Uh, is this her? Auntie Fran? Well, who is that? that? That baby in her arms? Oh, Cariad. Ambrosia, is it? 
Do you mean amnesia, ma'am? Well, I always said you ate too much creamed rice. No, ma'am, I think you mean... Oh, d- d- never mind. This picture. Who is this? This baby on Fran's lap. That's you, that is. Auntie Fran, holding you the day you was born. You two had a connection straight away, you did. She told me you had saved her. I never knew what she meant by that. Still don't. She died the night this photo was taken, in her sleep, peacefully. Should I be worrying about you, Cariad? No, ma'am. No, don't worry. I understand now. And I think I might have done something good. And you know, I think I feel a lot better for it. And I owe you an apology, ma'am. I am so lucky to have you in my life. I love you. And I'm sorry for being a cow. I love you too, Astrid. Anyway, you're never a cow. You're my little sweet potato, ain't you? You know, come on, let's get dressed up, my girl. We're going on the haunt. That evening, at the ball, Ma'am dressed as Elvira, mistress of the dark, slow dances with a deeply unconvincing and rapidly unwrapping Egyptian mummy smelling the chip fat. Meanwhile, I melt into the arms of Quasimodo, a.k.a. Peter Jennings. Oh, Astrid, the bells, the bells. I think I owe you an apology, Peter. Thank you for inviting me to the dance. He holds me tightly. Then, over Peter's shoulder, I spy a ghostly lady swaying from side to side with a little boy standing on her feet. I watch them as they laugh and dance for hours. Then, just before midnight, the boy looks up and waves at me and Fran turns with the most beautiful smile. And across the room she mouths the words, Thank you, before the two of them turn and holding hands, they disappear forever. <laughs>